Good morning, Chapel family. How's everybody doing this morning? Oh, y'all sound good. I want to do something before I get in my message that I just felt in during worship. If your Bible's turning to Psalm 91, I want to just kind of read this psalm over you um, just for a quick second. And we live in a day and time. I think tonight I will go to my fourth funeral this week. Um, just a lot of, lot of stuff going on in people's lives, a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, issues, a lot of battles, even as Pastor Brian was talking about, many times um, we lose sight that the God of the battles, the God of the breakthrough is also the God of the battle. And that when you're going through battles, the same God that's going to bring you the breakthrough is the God that's with you in the middle of that storm or that season. And there's, there's four kind of traps it says the enemy sets here in Psalm 91. It's anxiety, of sickness and disease, of fear, and of worry, and things like that. And so I'm going to just read it over you. It says this, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say, everybody say, I will say. So this is the psalmist having to remind himself and speak something out. There's there's something about the power of of saying things out loud. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So he's saying that. He's saying, you need to say, he's my refuge, he's my fortress, he's my God, I trust him. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love. It, this is a, I'm, I'm not preaching yet. I'm this is that freebie. It's interesting that the psalmist here changes from the point of view is from me dwelling, me dwelling, to all of a sudden God speaking to him, almost in a prophetic insight back. As he was praying, it's almost like God begins to speak back. And this is God speaking, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name, whom he calls to me. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue, rescue him and honor, and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you bring this word into agreement in every mind that's dealing with anxiety, every body dealing with sickness, every heart that's de- dealing with fear. Father, every soul that's dealing with offense and bitterness, I pray that you allow for this word to take root. And just as the psalmist, it was probably Moses who was writing this, as he was saying this and, and praying this to you, Father, you begin to prophesy back to him. I pray right now for your word to become alive and active in their minds, their hearts, their spirits. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. If you have a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, as I try to find my notes real quick. Matthew chapter 4 is entering scripture. We're, we're still in our Raise the Standard series talking about where we're going, who we're going to be. And as you came in, you probably saw some new merch that will help you kind of take the, the standard, raise the standard, and carry that out. But you also probably saw a couple other things. One of those things is there's registration now open for the She Conference at the Rock Family Worship Center in Huntsville. And so we're going to take a group of ladies, took tons of ladies last year. And so if you're interested in doing that, it's right there on the screen. You can join or register online through the Church Center app or text also, if you need help registering, they can help you out front and get you all types of registered. And so, a lot of good stuff on. Also, today was the, the launch of our new ministry, 678. So, our, our junior hires are now meeting over the student center during this service. So, that's a great opportunity for you. If you've been around here at any point in time, you probably know I have a heart for discipleship. I bleed it, I, I practice it, I, I love talking about it, I love discussing discipleship, I love seeing people become disciples and watching them be discipled. I, I just live and breathe that. And the reason I breathe that is because I believe that was Jesus' last words to the church, was literally go and make disciples. He didn't say go and get people to raise their hands or go get people to fill out a, a salvation card or, or go and get people to, to come and respond to all these. He said go and make disciples. 
And one of the best ways uh, I've seen this illustrated was an author, author named Dave Buring. I met David a couple years ago, and he, he uses this illustration to start his book called The Jesus Blueprint. Greatest book probably on discipleship I've ever read. He said there was a teacher, professor, on the first day of school, like many people who are about to start college this week at UNA or Northwest Shoals or, you know, maybe Alabama, or if you couldn't get into all those schools at Auburn, you know, all those other things. And, you know, if you really didn't graduate, you'd probably go to University of Tennessee, Knoxville and fit right in. So the professor stands up at the front of the first day of school and he says, listen, I hope you learn a lot in this class. I hope you enjoy this class. I want to tell you there's only two assignments in this class. He said, I want you to learn everything you can about this subject. I want you to learn it, breathe it, live it out. He said, there's only two assignments. I want to give you a chance to learn it and soak it up like a sponge. One, I want you to find somebody outside of this classroom that has no idea about this subject. And two, after you teach them all of that, at the end of class, there'll be a test that you'll sit down and take. So one assignment is find somebody to reteach. And we know, who, who has a Southern Baptist background? Raise your hand in this room. You know, the joke is everybody used to be Baptist at one point in time. So Southern Baptists were the kings and queens of, this, of Sunday school. Sunday school was great, but if you talk to Southern Baptist denominational leaders, they'll tell you the beauty, the beauty of Sunday school was not the students, it was the teachers. The teachers grew more than anybody else because they had to learn and, and study and prepare for their class. And so this teacher's kind of using that same component. He's like, learn everything you can and then find somebody else and teach them everything because as you teach, you actually learn more. He said, at the end of the semester, we'll take one test. And so they go throughout the, the year, and the students love this class. Literally, no essays, no research papers, no thesis, no homework, no quizzes, no tests. Literally, they're just coming and learning and, and supposed to be finding somebody to teach it all back to. Well, it gets the day before the last final exam, and the professor says, hey, remember, there were two things I told you about this class. One, they're find somebody to teach them everything you learn and, and share with them everything I teach you. And then two, there'll be a test at the end of the semester. He said, well, tomorrow's the day for the test. I need you to bring in the person that you've been teaching all this stuff to because they're going to take your test. And that is discipleship. It's not enough just to learn. You're supposed to learn, obey, and apply and reteach what God has taught you. That is discipleship. And I think one of the detriments to the American church is we love information, we love knowledge, we love all these things, but we've become like stagnant ponds full of mosquitoes because we just receive, we never release back out. And I believe what God is about to do in this next season, and not just us, but for the capital C church, is begin to releasing the knowledge we've been building up, releasing the wisdom, releasing the life, and pouring that back out into other people. Because the Great Commission is to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe or obey all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you always. All of that, the baptizing, the teaching, and the bank are all exponents of making disciples. And that is my prayer, that we will be disciples. You say, and I've heard people say, well, if I'm saved, why do I need discipleship? I've heard that. If, if I'm saved, if I'm always saved, as, as you know, the Baptist church told me to grow up, if, if I'm always saved, why do I need a discipleship? Well, lots of reasons, but just break it down really simply is salvation is a decision. Discipleship is a lifestyle. And nowhere throughout the Bible do we see anywhere where there's just a decision and you go live your life however you want to. It was all about a lifestyle of holiness and following after Jesus. But one of my favorite authors, Dallas Willard, said it this way. He said, we've come to a day which vampire Christianity is run rampant. What is vampire Christianity? If you ever watch horror movies, vampires, they what? They suck blood. He said, vampire Christianity is when you just want the blood of Jesus and nothing else. You don't want his life. You don't want his holiness. You don't want his, to follow him. You don't want his blessings. You don't want his promises. You don't want his Holy Spirit. You just want enough blood to be forgiven of your sin and, and keep on. And the problem with that is you don't see that anywhere in Scripture. For one, there's absolutely nothing in what Jesus himself or the disciples taught us that someone can make a decision for forgiveness and then just go back to their old lifestyle. Two, if we don't become apprentices of kingdom living, we remain locked in defeat. The reason people say, well, I got saved, I gave it to Jesus, but nothing really changed is because they thought the change happened in the decision and the change doesn't happen in the decision, the change happens in the lifestyle change. Three, only avid discipleship to Christ through the Holy Spirit brings inward transformation, changes in feelings, and changes in the inward 
person. You don't change somebody's character by preaching at them. You change someone's character by going life to life with somebody. And for the one who makes sure to walk as close to Jesus as possible, there comes this reliable power that comes along with your life. Our power, and people for Pentecostal circles think the power just comes down from heaven. No, the power comes from walking closely with Jesus. I believe in the day of Pentecost. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is an outpouring of power. But the power comes, the closer you walk with Jesus, the more power you have to overcome things in your life. And all those are byproducts of discipleship. And so in Matthew chapter 4, it says it this way. This is what Jesus is starting his ministry. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me. Everybody say, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed after him. Like, to me, it's interesting. Jesus doesn't show up and say, Hey, uh, preach a sermon. He doesn't show up and, and give a, th- a theological debate. He doesn't show them a job description or resume and say, you know, if you, if you come and work for me, here's what you do. Here's the benefits package. Here's the responsibilities. Here's the salary. Here's the time off. Here's the vacation days. No, he literally just shows up and says, hey, you, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. And they left like, if we were all honest in our day and age, if Jesus showed up to you and just said, hey, follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men, most of us would have a ton of questions to ask before we left everything to follow him. We would ask him, you know, when do I get time off to go home and see my family for Thanksgiving? When, when do I get time off for me time? When, when's my me time, Jesus? Like, none, like, that didn't happen. He says, follow me. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. One of the reasons why is traditionally, disciples chose the rabbi. They would find the rabbi. They liked their teaching. They wanted to model their life after them. They'd find the rabbi. But here Jesus is choosing his disciples. Do you realize that? You didn't choose Jesus. Jesus chose you. Do you know the honor and privilege that is? He says, hey, I want you to be my apprentice in the kingdom. Traditionally, most rabbis taught you to follow the law. Jesus says, I don't need you following a piece of paper. I want you following me. I want you to look like me, talk like me, sound like me, love like me, live like me, walk like me, act like me, cast demons out like me. I want you to have a relationship with the Father like me. I want you to pray like me. He switches the game up completely. A disciple is not somebody who literally wanted to just learn everything from their, from their rabbi. They want to learn and do just like the rabbi. See, in our westernized thinking, we just want to learn. How, what did Jesus say? What did the, what's the Bible say? What's, and that's great. But the part we're missing is it's not enough to know what Jesus knew. You got to do what Jesus did. It's not enough just to know how he lived. You're supposed to live how he lived. It's not just enough to know who he loved and how he loved. We're supposed to love like him. And it only happens as you begin to follow him and walk after him. And so the the main point of this is this. Disciples don't just believe in Jesus. Disciples actually follow Jesus. You say, well, pastor, that is not mind-blowing. It is in this day and age and culture where people think the two are the same thing. Demons believe in Jesus. Actually, a lot of secular humanists believe in Jesus. Actually, a lot of the people in the world believe in Jesus. A lot of people think Jesus was a great teacher, a great philosopher, a great rabbi, but they don't think he's worthy of following. The difference between the disciple and a believer is this, somebody who believes, you can ask anybody in Florence, like, yeah, I believe, in, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God. But their life doesn't look like Jesus' life. They can say, oh, I, I believe in God, but their life doesn't reflect. And so we're in this day and age where practical atheism is run rampant. And practical atheism is you believe in God, believe, but you practically don't live like there is a God. And so the reason that's a fact is because believism is just believing, I believe there's a God, but a discipleship says, I believe in him so much, I'm going to follow him wherever he goes. I'm going to follow his example, I'm going to follow his lead, I'm going to follow his life, I'm going to follow him wherever he may go. And that is the difference. And God does never in the Bible say, I want people just to believe. He says, I want them to follow after me. And disciples are people that are with Jesus 
learning to become more like him. And if we wanted to solve all the cultural issues in our culture, if we want to solve all the cultural debates, we don't need to have more elections. We don't need to have more teaching. We just need more of the believers to actually live in love like Jesus. And to follow him into the marketplace, follow him into the home, follow him into the school, follow him into the ballot box, follow him into politics, follow him into teaching, follow him into coaching, follow him wherever he may go, follow his lead. Because if you follow his lead, you'll end up accomplishing his will for your life. It's a, it's a simple core respondence. And so in the scripture, it, it has these three things, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And what he's saying, I, the way I look at it is, the head, the heart, and the hands. Discipleship is the head, the heart. Follow me is the head. You have to make a choice to follow him. The heart is he'll make you. That's the heart. But then he'll make you fishers of men. That's the hands. The head, heart, and hands. If we were honest, most of us think discipleship is just a head issue. You got to know this doctrine, know the statement of beliefs, know the theology, know this. And that's just a part of it. God doesn't want just your head. He wants your heart. He doesn't just want your heart, he wants your hands. And so the disciples knew that when I follow him, he's going to use my head, he's going to use my heart, he's going to use my hands. As I follow him, I will look like him, love like him, and everything else. So I, real quick, I just want to give you, knock these three things down. Follow me, follow me is the head side. It's a, a disciple chooses to follow and obey Jesus. They make a choice. They immediately left their nets behind. They decided he's worth following. They decided he's worth imitating. They decided he's an example or a model worth. If you wanted to break it down, it's this simple. Jesus leads, we follow. Not I lead and I try to get Jesus to follow me so that way if I need a blessing, he's close enough to give it to me. It's not that I, I make a choice and I ask God to bless my choice. It's not that I make a decision and I ask God to protect me from the consequences of those decisions. The difference is Jesus is leading and I'm following. See, when you, when you get saved, there's this dramatic change that happens between you ruling your own life to then God ruling your life for you. And there's a choice that you have to count the cost. Is he worthy enough to immediately leave the nets behind me? I, I don't know what your net is, but for them, it was their occupation. That's how they provided for themselves and for their family. That was their identity. They were fishermen. Their nets was part of their identity. And it says, Jesus said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets behind. They didn't have a plan B, didn't have a plan C. They didn't know where they were going to sleep the next night, didn't know where they were going to work. They literally left everything behind, their old identity, their old provision, their old protection, to follow after him. See, when Jesus calls... The, when you answer the phone, it's an all or nothing phone call. See, I think Alicia was telling me the other day, she had like 97 missed calls from this same spam number. Right, when spam numbers call, if I don't have the number on my phone, I don't want to answer it. I don't know who's on the other line. But if Toy or the kids call, I answer it immediately. Why? There's a relationship there. When Jesus calls you, there's too many people that look at Jesus as spam mail. And the reason for that is because when, when spam calls, it's, you know, for some of us, it's a bill collector. Hey, don't you know you owe $37.62 to Comcast? Yes, I'm never paying that. You never fixed anything. My internet never worked. I'm never paying that. Take me to court. I'm sure the judge will decide with me. But sometimes if they're trying to sell you something, right? They're trying to sell you something to purchase. And so we don't answer the phone because there's an ask on the other line. And I believe that when people ignore the call of Jesus, the reason is because they don't want to answer the ask. Peter and Andrew here, they were willing to answer the ask and decided to follow after Jesus. And what I've learned is that even when people answer that call, they say, yes, I'll, I'll pick up the phone, there's Jesus, and they answer the call. There, there seems to be a, a waning that people get saved and they're on fire for Jesus. They're falling after Jesus. They're in love with Jesus. They're telling people about Jesus. But then it begins to wane. And the reason is they are not discipling their, their mind or their head. And the people I've found that follow Jesus with their mind are people that have this holy fascination and this holy curiosity about Jesus. Like the reason I, 
I follow Jesus so closely. I want to know what he knows. I want to know the mysteries of God. I want to know the promises of God. I want to know how he interacted. Like I'm hungry. I'm curious about certain things. Like when he cast out demons, was everybody freaked out or were they like celebrating? I want to know when he healed people and their arms were extended out or blind eyes were open. I want to know how he did it. Why? Did, when he sat down with sinners and ate lunch with them, I want to know how he responded to the crowds. I want to know. I have a curiosity. My mind is curious. If you have a mind that's curious, it's either filled with doubt or holy curiosity. And the cure for dealing with doubt, or, you know, I don't know if God is real. I, I don't know if this is real. I don't know if his word. I don't know about this. The cure for that is to follow him with your head. And let that holy curiosity draw you closer and closer and closer and closer. It's like the woman with the issue of blood. You know, there's a whole lot of people in the crowd today. If you don't know the story, so this woman didn't deal with, with an issue of blood for 12 years. Went to doctors, went to, you know, in our day, surgeons and medical professionals, and, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. So she'd been bleeding. Could you imagine the fatigue of that much blood loss? The embarrassment of everywhere you go, people see that you're bleeding or they know that you're bleeding. Could you imagine the fear, the pain, and the agony? But yet she'd heard that Jesus was in town. She'd heard that he was a healer. There was a curiosity there. There was a hunger there that if I can get closer to Jesus and follow him through the crowd, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, then I can be made whole. And she pushed through embarrassment. She pushed through the crowd because her mind was curious. She was hungry. There was something about Jesus that if I can get close enough, I'll get the answer I need. And when you dig down in that scripture, it's actually a verse from Malachi 3 where it says there's healing in his wings. And those wings were actually the, the tassels on his prayer shawl. And so she knew the word that if I can get to touch the hem of his garment or the tassels, it says there's healings in those tassels. If I could just touch those tassels, then I could be made whole. But that came from holy curiosity. And there's enough books, enough commentaries, enough devotionals that sometimes all you need is a little bit of curiosity to drive you to follow Jesus the next step of your life. But you're not going to follow him if you're still holding on to your nets. And so the question would be, what is the nets you need to leave behind to truly follow Jesus. Now for Peter and Andrew, it was fishing nets. That was their identity, that was their purpose, that was their vision. But what about for you? Maybe there's an identity from your past you're trying to carry along with you and you're wondering why it's so hard to follow Jesus. You can't follow Jesus by dragging the nets of your past with you. Maybe it's sexual identity, maybe it's fear, maybe it's your reputation or your shame or your guilt, maybe it's your pain, maybe it's bitterness, maybe it's unforgiveness, maybe it's you want to be your own provider, maybe it's you're protecting yourself, maybe it's your identity from who you used to be. Whatever it is, you can't truly follow Jesus until you count the cost. Is he worthy enough for me to leave these things behind? But he also says, follow me and I will make you, which is the heart. A disciple is continually being changed by Jesus to look more like Jesus. Touch your neighbor and say, you got to be changed. Now, religion will tell you, you get changed and then you come to Jesus. Scripture shows nothing of that in Scripture. No one, the one with the issue of blood, just to keep the example going, didn't say, well, I need to get better, I need to get healthy, I need to get clean before I go touch Jesus. No, she got to Jesus and then he changed her. Zacchaeus didn't clean himself up and get right and then go see Jesus. He came to Jesus and then Jesus changed him. See, a disciple is someone who's always continually moldable and humble enough to be changed by God. Even on your deathbed, there'll be things that Jesus wants to change in you because you never outgrow the image of Jesus. In Romans 8, 29, one of my favorite verses says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Do well, you know what that means? Your purpose, once you get saved on earth, is not ministry, it's not a job, it's not a career, it's not a vision, it's not a dream, it's not your best life now. It's none of the, Your purpose is to conform to the image of Jesus. Do you realize... Before the word Christian ever came out, they were referred to as disciples. Then it said these Christians, these little Christ, meaning people to see and be like, that's a little Jesus. Like, I don't know how you grow. My name's Bobby. 
My dad's name was Bobby Joe, because we're rednecks, and my grandfather's name was Robert L.D. Gorley. No one knows what the L.D. stood for, but they called him Bobby. So if you said something at a family dinner gathering, I said, Bobby, three heads turn around. So they started calling me Little Bobby, or Little Bobby, Big Bobby, and Bigger Bobby, right? Do you realize that when people see you, they should see Big Jesus and Little Jesus, Like your identity should be so wrapped up in him that they actually think you're a little version of him. That if Jesus were to show up, he'd call you my mini me. This is my mini me. That's how intently Jesus wants to change you from the inside out. That he wants to clean you up so much that you become a mirror that reflects his light, his glory, and his image to everybody you see. And so there is no point where you stop being good enough or cleaned up enough to be like him. And I think as the heart version, if the head version is this holy curiosity, the heart version is this beholding him. And beholding him is in worship where you're beholding the glory of Jesus. Beholding the love of Jesus. It's in prayer where you're sitting at the feet of Jesus like Mary. Everybody else is working around you, but she's literally just sitting at his feet beholding him. Eyes like fire. A heart full of love. Just beholding him. And as you behold him, you become more like him. It's impossible to behold the image and glory and holiness of God and not leave away without something changing about you. And so we're at a place in time that as we begin to to follow him, he begins to make us and remake us. And we don't change ourselves. It's not like, well, I gotta I gotta pull myself off my bootstraps, I gotta do better. No, as you behold him, he changes you. As you look at him, he changes you. As you follow him, you follow him away from things you used to get into to follow him where he wants you to be. If you want to know God's will for your life, just follow Jesus. You'll end up there at some point. Jeremiah references this when he says, I was in the potter's house and I saw a potter in the clay. He talks about the molding and remolding. The the vessel actually falls off and it breaks and he brings it back up and begins to to fix and reshape. Do you realize your life, you are a piece of pottery. You are a vessel for God. And 2 Timothy says some vessels are used for for honorable uses and, and ministry purposes. Some are used for common purposes. But you are a vessel. And the whole purpose of life is for you to be a vessel that does not distract people from the contents that are on the inside. And the contents on the inside are the very spirit of God, his glory, his reputation, his love, his peace, his joy, and his hope. And your job is to make sure the vessel is clear enough that people can see what's on the inside of you. But as life happens, when you get saved, there's there's some rough edges, there's some issues. And I think just as Jeremiah saw the potter, as he saw him, have you ever seen somebody do potter before? That's a lot of work, not for the clay, but for the person doing it. They're turning that wheel, getting cramps in their legs. They're getting water. They're, they're using their hands. Their hands have to be cramped up and sore. And they're just pumping that wheel, and they're continually reshaping that clay. Now, if you go into Romans 9, like how could the clay tell the potter what to do with the clay? Who is the clay to say, well, you know, I think you should do this. No, the purpose of the clay is to sit humbly before the potter. And as the potter takes the, the water, which is the washing of the word or, or the Holy Spirit, it begins to, as it begins to shape that, there's things on you that is going to hurt to be rubbed off. But the, the, the beauty of Jesus is this. He doesn't chisel it away. He didn't take out a hammer and chisel off the rough edges. He didn't take out sandpaper and rub them. He actually uses the water and the washing of his word to gently and slowly begin to rub with his own hands to remove the rough edges. And through his own hands, he begins to model and shape and mold you into the image he wants you to be. In your entire life, he will shape you and he'll reshape you. He'll make you and he'll remake you. The purpose of discipleship is for your heart to be made to look like the heart of Jesus. And there's no one in this room that has the heart they need yet. And so some of us have some rough edges. Some of us have some things that need to be cleaned down. And he makes us and he reshapes us. You go through life and you fall off. And just like Jeremiah, he picks you up, puts you back on the potter's wheel to reshape you again. He's not concerned with how many times you fall off as much as he is who he's shaping you into. 
It only happens as you behold him and you see him. One of my favorite definitions that I've come up with in discipleship is discipleship is learning backwards. You say, what does that mean? If you don't get anything else, get this. The moment you get saved, it's not a choice you make. It's a supernatural miracle between the earthly things and the heavenly things. The Holy Spirit has convicted you. He's drawn you to Jesus. You respond with repentance. And through that, this miracle takes place called the new birth. Being born again, regenerated, whatever theological term you want to use. Where all the old things are passed away. You are now born into a new family. So yeah, your dad may be your earthly dad biologically. But now you have a new daddy with a new DNA, a new inheritance, a new family tree. Some of you, that's the greatest blessing you ever get. And this miracle takes place. And here's what we think. In religious world, we think, okay, I got saved. Now I need to figure out how to do this, do this, do this, do this. And you begin to work on all these things to try to be who you think you're supposed to be. But what really happens is this. The moment you get saved, you are 120% saved. You're not partially saved. You're not halfway saved. You're not just waiting for the rest of yourself. You are completely saved. You are 100% a son or daughter of the Most High God. There are no stepchildren in the kingdom of heaven. There's no foster kids in the kingdom of heaven. You are 100% a child of the Most High God. The moment you are saved. Now, Paul said in Philippians, but you'll work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Meaning on the inside, in my spirit, I am a prince or a princess of the kingdom of heaven. I have the same access to God in his throne room. I have the same inheritance that Jesus had. I have everything, the same family. I have it all. I have everything on the inside of me. But I need to work that out into my mind, my hands, my life, my relationships, my reputation. I need to work it out. And so I believe discipleship is when you learn backwards. You start learning what you received when you said yes to Jesus. You start learning and applying to your life to have everything. See, there's a difference between possession and occupation. So you possess the kingdom of heaven the moment you get saved. But you learn to occupy here on earth through learning what you got. The only way I can explain it is I got four kids, Toy and I. We got three daughters and a son. So with three daughters, I love them. Like the moment they were born, they were my kids. They're 100% my daughter. If they knew what I would do for them, they, would, they wouldn't talk back as much. If they knew what I would lay down for them, if they knew what I would sacrifice for them. And even with RJ as a son, there's something about the son being that, that name carrier. The moment he was born, I knew I'd give him everything I owned. I knew I'd protect him with my life. Oh my, but there's something about, they know, they were 100% my kids. But you know what they'll spend the rest of their entire life learning? What it means to be a son or a daughter of Bobby and Toya Gorley. They'll spend the rest of their life learning what they have access to. They'll spend the rest of their lives learning how much we love them and what we would lay down for them. They'll spend the rest of their lives learning how much we'll sacrifice for them. See, discipleship is nothing more than you learning what God did in you at the moment of salvation. So you begin walking in that freedom, walking in that power, walking in that strength, walking in that freedom, walking in that hope, walking in that joy. You got all of it when you're saved, but you don't access the treasure chest until you break through in discipleship. And you learn that through beholding him. So the question would be, how much are you beholding him? How much are you beholding Jesus? How much time are you spending in prayer? And I'm not saying you got to spend hours. There. I'm just saying we, we know. Stats tell us, I, I know most believers don't even spend five minutes a day in prayer. And you can tell because of the way we act and react to the news around us. You can tell how we interact with people on social media. You can learn it by seeing the church in action. And if we would just behold him, maybe our interactions and our actions would look more like Jesus. So for you, what can you do this week to just behold him? To look at Jesus in the face and sit with him as a Mary and worship him. So how do I do that? I, there's an app I use from time to time called Lectio 365. I, I love this app. It's just a little prayer exercise app. But for, maybe for you, it's just a sit down to just tell him how much you love him. God, man, I love you so much. 
when I was lost and broken, everyone had turned their back on me. You stood beside me. I lift up your name. I bless your holy name. It's a name that is holy. It's beautiful. It comes off my lips in such a beautiful way. Father, I bless you for your plan and your providence. I bless you for your grace and your mercy that I've, I've seen and tasted so many times. Father, I thank you so much for my family. God, I bless you for the blessing and gift of family. And just begin to bless his name. And as you do, you behold him and he'll begin to change you. He says, follow me and I'll make you what? Fishers of men. It's interesting in that scripture, he literally takes their earthly occupation and gives it eternal purpose. They are fishers of fish. He says, no, 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 you'll be a fisherman still, but you're going to fish for souls. You're going to fish for men. That's the hands side of this. See, it's the head, the heart, and the hands. You need all three to actually be a disciple. The Jesus' disciples, they, they learned, they were changed, but they also did what Jesus had done. And that's the mission of Jesus, that when you get saved, you are saved on purpose for a purpose. Touch your neighbor and say purpose. You were saved on, you didn't get just saved just because God wanted you to be an angel in heaven. He saved you, which is not theologically true. God saved you because he has a purpose for you here on earth that has a purpose in heaven. He saved you with an end product in mind. You were actually created with an end product in mind. He saved you for a purpose. He didn't save you to sit on a pew. He didn't save you to just sing songs of worship. He didn't save you just to read your Bible. He saved you for a purpose to take your earthly occupation and use it for eternal glory. Ephesians 2.8, which we use here for the I was but God I am, Verses 8 through 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, but it is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. They skip this. So most people say, we were not saved by works. There's nothing about works. Oh, look at this, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Notice any good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you realize God has prepared good works in front of you? He's prepared good works for you at your job, at your school, at your home. He, in your neighborhood, he's prepared good works for you. And he saved you so now that you can walk in those good works that Jesus actually prepared people to interact with, people to see. If you're a teacher, do you realize God providentially created and designed strategies to have every one of those specific kids in your classroom? It's no coincidence in the kingdom of heaven. If you're a coach, do you realize every one of those kids God brought to your football team or your basketball team or your baseball team because he knew you were going to be there and he prepared good works beforehand for you. Realize that your job, the people you work with that are getting on your nerves, the people that keep taking smoke breaks every 30 minutes, you're like, bro, you took a took a smoke break 30 minutes ago. Well, it takes me 15 minutes to smoke. So you work 15 minutes out of every hour. And you're making me pick up your slack. Do you realize God brought them to that job because he knew you would be there? And what's our prayer in church? Oh, God, if you could just get me out of this environment into a better environment. What you're really saying is, I'm not really a disciple. I just want to be sheltered from the mission God has brought me to. Like he saved you to use your hands for a purpose. And I love the fact that Jesus goes from head to heart to hands. See, religion will go from hands to head to heart. But God goes from the head. You've got to know who he is. Then you become more like him. Then you do what he did. Daniel eleven thirty two, one 32, one of the great scriptures in the Old Testament, King James Version, says, for those who know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. Those who know the head shall be the heart, shall do great exploits. We want to skip the heart and the head and just go straight to the exploits sometimes. No, no, you can't do the right exploits until you have the right heart. And as you do, God will begin to use you, use your hands, use your story, use your life, not just to be a disciple, but to make other disciples. Great story. Some of you have probably heard this before. I read this in a book a long time ago. There was a guy in California, which all the crazies live in California. It's always been that way. It's never going to change. All the crazies are in California. This guy was bored one day. He wanted to be a pilot. He went to pilot school. They flunked him out because his vision was so bad. He tried to go to the Air Force. They wouldn't let him in. So he had to go to the Army instead because that's where everybody gets kicked out of the Air Force, goes in the Army. 
but he wanted to fly and he was bored one day and so he said, you know, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna fly my own plane. He goes to the army surplus store and buys a bunch of weather balloons, a helium tank. He straps them to a lawn chair, chains off the lawn chair to the bumper of his car, inflates the helium balloons, goes inside, gets him a cooler with a couple of ham and cheese sandwiches in it, a couple more beers, because obviously he'd been drinking already, and gets him a BB gun. His plan was, I'm going to cut the little rope that's holding my lawn chair. I'll get up a little bit high. When I get scared, I'll start shooting down the balloons one by one. So he has his cooler with beer and his ham sandwiches, his lawn chair, gets in the lawn chair, cuts the rope. Instead of slowly going up, it shoots him up like a SpaceX rocket. Elon Musk would be jealous. He shoots up. He goes so high. Now he's scared to shoot the balloons down because he's going to die. So he's close to LAX airport. There's planes circling around. A plane spots him. They call on the radio. Sir, there's a man in a lawn chair with a gun outside our window. So now the Coast Guard gets called. Well, now the, the, the winds off the California coast are taking him farther out to sea. So now you have a man in a lawn chair, 30,000 feet, being blown out to sea with the gun. The Coast Guard comes. They have to get him down. They bring him home. The news is there. And you know what they ask him? Like, all the, why did you do it? Here's what he said. It's one of those profound words. He says, a man just can't sit around all day and do nothing. And when I read that, I thought of a quote Martin Luther had said years ago. And I actually wrote down, it's, this is Martin Luther, the reformer, said this, a man cannot be idle, for the need of his body drives him, and he is compelled to do many good works to reduce it to subjections. Meaning your hands are going to do a work. Your hands were created to work. Realize in the garden, what did God give Adam to do? A, a garden to work. We are called to work. You don't work for your salvations, but your hands are going to do good stuff or they're going to do bad stuff. The reason we push champions here is not because we need more champions. It's because your hands need something to do. If your hands are doing the, the will of God, they'll do the will of Satan. And God says, I will redeem your hands from the works of the world to use them for the works of the kingdom. And as you do, it changes the world around you. And so the question would be this. What does God want to use your hands or your life to do in the lives of other people? Like where has God placed you at? What career, what location, what employment? Where has God placed you at that he can use you to advance his kingdom in the lives of other people. Dallas Willard said this way, just be who Jesus would be if he was you. If Jesus was you and he was a teacher, how would Jesus talk to those kids? If Jesus was you and he worked at your job, how would Jesus work? If Jesus was you and he was a student, how would Jesus study? Be who Jesus would be if he was you. And so how could you take advantage of that? Maybe becoming a champion here at church, maybe going on a mission trip, maybe serving at the Dream Center, maybe coaching a little league team because we know coaches are some of the most influential people in people's lives. Start a discipleship group we're going to talk about in the next few weeks. Pray for your patients as a doctor or a nurse, even if it's not audibly at home. Pray for your patients. Carry your Bible to work or school with you prayer walk your neighborhood or your school. Man, there was a coach at our high school, our head football coach who's now retired. He would pray once a week. He would show up to school early and pray over every single altar or altar, locker, same thing, locker, altar, same thing. Locker of every one of his football players. Every week, he'd find their lockers in the locker room. He'd go to the school locker, find them, and he'd pray over those lockers. There's something about somebody being the mission. Invite unchurched friends and family to church with you or start a friendship with a non-believer to share life on life with. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That is the heartbeat of the kingdom. And I pray it becomes your heartbeat to live like Jesus, to love like Jesus, and to be like Jesus, and to do what Jesus would do if Jesus was. If we would just bow your heads and close your eyes just for a second. We're going to take communion in just a moment. But I'm going to give you a challenge, then a, a chance to respond. The challenge is this. I'm, I'm challenging everybody in this room not to be a believer, but to be a disciple. 
We're going to walk through in the next few weeks what that looks like here at Chapel to, to move people to have a thousand disciple makers here. But the first couple of steps would be this, to follow him. To make the choice, to count the cost. Is he worth following? I can tell you, after 20 years of following Jesus, I didn't think he was worthy to begin with. I was an atheist. I was agnostic. I didn't think it was worth sacrificing the nets that I had. But the moment I met him face to face, I left my nets, I left my life, I left my identity behind to follow him. And I'll tell you, he's proven himself worthy every single day. So maybe for you, maybe it's today's the day you begin to follow Jesus. That you, every head is bowed, every eyes closed just for a minute. Say, that's me. I'm not going to have you come forward. If, if you said it's me, I just, today needs to be the day I start following Jesus. Not making a decision, not asking for salvation. I'm going to start following Jesus. That you just slip your hand up real quick. Thank you. Anybody else? Put your hands down after you raise them. I'm going to pray in just a second. But the second question would be this. Maybe the heart side, God is making you and remaking you. Maybe you've been a little stubborn on that potter's wheel. Maybe God has begun to touch places that you didn't want him to touch. Maybe wounds or scars or things that you really hold close to. And God has been trying to reshape you into his image. And you've been stubborn. You say, you know what, today's the day I realize he's doing it out of love. He's simply trying to make me the best version of me I possibly can be. That's you. So you know what, that's me. There's some areas of my life I need God to, to reshape and remold. That's you, just slip your hand up real quick. last one is this. He wants to make you a fisher of men. Maybe for you, it's not a fisher of men. Maybe it's a teacher of men or women. Maybe it's a coach of men or women. Maybe it's a, a business person of men and women. Maybe it's an employer of men and women. But God wants to use you where he's at. God has strategically placed you as a missionary of the kingdom of heaven exactly where you are. You are not where you are by accident. You are there by divine intervention. Actually, I'll say it this way. You are there because you're the answer to somebody's prayer. Somebody was praying, much like we pray. Somebody's praying, God, just bring a believer upon my lost son or daughter's path. God, bring a believer across my mom or dad's path. God, bring a believer, somebody who's on fire for you across my, my cousin's path. You are an answer to somebody's prayer. It's time to step into that prayer and begin to answer it. That's you. So you know, I want God to use me where he's placed me. I want him to use my hands, my, my life, my experiences, my career. I want him to use me as a missionary, as an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven, right where I am. That's you. Just slip your hand up real quick. Thank you. All the room. Put your hands down. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for the blessing of you choosing us. If I can only imagine Peter and Andrew's minds when Jesus walks by and says, you, I choose you being called out upon all the people to follow after him. Father, we thank you for the honor and privilege it is to follow you. For those who decided to follow you today, Father, I just pray right now for the washing of your blood, to wash away the sin, the shame, the guilt, the fear, the anxiety, and begin to follow after you wholeheartedly in their new life. Father, I pray for new dreams, new vision, new purpose, new, new friendships, new relationships, Father. I pray for new passions, new desires. Father, those who want to need to be reshaped and remolded, Father, let's pray right now for the washing and the regeneration of your word. To wash off rough edges, to remold, to reshape, to keep them soft, to keep them moldable, to keep them pliable. And Father, those who are placed in strategic places, I pray right now for a boldness and courage to be the hands, the mouth, and the feet, and the heart of Jesus right where they are. Father, for teachers, I pray right now for a prophetic insight into their students' lives. I pray for words of knowledge. I pray for discernment. I pray for wisdom. Father, for coaches, I pray right now for influence in young men and young women's lives. Father, for business owners, I pray for a kingdom mindset first in their places of employment. Father, for employees, I pray right now to work as unto the Lord, Father, to demonstrate how they follow you as how they work in the marketplace. So we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name.